Um, my name is Emma Moore. I'm the curatorial assistant for the public programme here. I'm um, very excited about tonight's screening. Uh, so yes, welcome to tonight's event, Animation Unchained, the adult cartoons of Ralph Bakshi. And uh, tonight's film, Bakshi's Heavy Traffic, has been selected for screening by Tala Madani, who's showing upstairs, and will be introduced by Paul Wells. Um, the influence of comic books and uh, cartoons is evident in the work of Tala Madani in the very expressive uh, black outlines that she uses in her paintings. Um, and it's also the uh, very heightened sense of action within the space of the canvas. Um, her subversive use of humour and violence comes to life quite literally in her short animations. And it's through both painting and these short films that Madani addresses complex ideas of power imbalances and uh, societal insecurities. And that's something that chimes with the work of underground uh, cartoon artists like uh, Bakshi. Uh, so it's a pleasure to welcome Paul Wells, who will uncover and expand on some of the complexities and nuances of adult cartoons as a radical and progressive art form within the history of visual culture. Uh, Professor Paul Wells is director of the Animation Academy, a research group dedicated to cutting-edge engagement with animation based at Loughborough University. Paul has written extensively on animation, and recent publications include The Animated Bestiary, Animals, Cartoons and Culture from 2009, Reimagining Animation, Contemporary Moving Image Cultures from 2008, and uh, recently contributed uh, to the book A Companion to Film Comedy with the title, uh, a chapter titled, which I quite like, uh, Laughter is Ten Times More Powerful Than a Scream in the Case of Animated Comedy, which seems to resound quite nicely with uh, the work upstairs. Um, Paul is also chair of the Association of British Animation Collections, a collaborative initiative with the BFI, BAFTA, and National Media Museum. So, following Paul's introduction, we'll screen the film, which is uh, 77 minutes, so we should be finished just before half eight. Uh, so, thank you all for coming, and I'll hand over to Paul. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, it's good to see everybody. You, you've had the good taste to come out and uh, witness this uh, movie tonight and this introduction, so well done you. Uh, you could have been watching uh, Hollyoaks or probably the ITV News, but no, you're here, embracing this... I don't know, awesome introduction for this film. You know, the, 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 uh, my, my take on this, obviously, is that halfway house between, yeah, an academic uh, idea of what Bakshi kind of represents and the kind of work that he, that he did, but at the same time, you know, it's a, you know, it's, you know, it's a public talk, you know, you don't want to be bombarded with theory. So, um, bottom line to it is that I'm going to try and introduce uh, Bakshi's stuff in, in ways, hopefully, that are accessible and pertinent to, hopefully, your own knowledges of Bakshi, and then, of course, the showing of the film film tonight. So onwards and upwards, let's, let's have a look. So context, what's the context that we're going to explore uh, tonight for Ralph Bakshi's films? Well, basically for Bakshi, one of the biggest kind of issues, of course, is the relationship to New York and its underground arts tradition. Um, it, it's absolutely kind of... Uh, embedded really in the, in, in the way in which Bakshi worked and the kind of period in which he worked and ultimately defines really his, his practice. Um, you know, I've talked with colleagues today and talked with people here at, at the gallery. Bakshi's quite interesting in the sense that um, within animation cultures in general, most people now see Bakshi as someone who they look back on fondly and importantly as someone for, for what they represented in the history of animation, a changing uh, moment in the history of animation, but they less value the work. So I think this is a really kind of interesting moment in the sense that obviously uh, the exhibition kind of uh, very much values the work, values, uh, you know, Bakshi's notion of caricature, his content, uh, his particular way of bringing kind of a, a social vision uh, to a particular kind of satiric vision. Um, so all of those, all those kind of ideas are at stake both in the exhibition and in Bakshi's work, but of course relate to this underground arts tradition. So I'm going to look at him in, in relation to that, equally of course in relation to animation history where Bakshi fits there. Inevitably, too, one of the biggest things to perhaps take into account is that we tend to ghettoise uh, animation filmmakers, animation directors, within animation history alone, instead of perhaps opening up 
uh, their significance and influence in relation to cinema in general. Um, in recent years, for example, finally, somebody like uh, Hao Miyazaki has been seen as an important filmmaker per se in Japan, rather than just the idea that he makes great animated films. But these are long battles. You know, these battles are, are, are hard, hard fought and hard won to try and actually get animation filmmakers recognised within the bigger picture of cinema. So in some senses, uh, Bakshi's achievements you know, can be read in, in, in that way. Of course, uh, the whole kind of way in which Baxi uh, addresses American culture and society, particularly in, in, you know, in, uh, in tonight's film, and thereafter, what do we see as his legacy? One of the kind of big benefits, of course, of, of, uh, of the internet is the fact that now niche audiences for all sorts of uh, artists, practitioners, bands, whatever they choose to be, can mobilise much more clearly and actually protect the legacies of people's achievements uh, from the past as they try to sustain them in, in their careers, uh, you know, later in their careers when they're often less acknowledged. So we'll come back to that uh, in a moment. So. The underground arts uh, context, most of it, you, I'm sure, will know that kind of Robert uh, Crumb's comics, of course, have revolutionised the medium there. And it was actually believed fundamentally that a similar approach could revolutionise animation. We tend even now to think about animation in the spirit of the mainstream features of Disney, of Pixar. Perhaps if we think a little more kind of closer to home, we might think of the sitcoms like The Simpsons, Family Guy, uh, and so forth. We might have some sense of anime and, and, and Miyazaki perhaps, but kind of the independent sector uh, within animation is still really championed mainly by the festivals and by the art house uh, you know, cinema audiences. So in a certain sense, uh, Bakshi even in that moment was working against the grain because you know, he was going to have to reinvent how animation was positioned even in that moment. Uh, and even now we have to recall somebody like Bakshi as someone who changed the nature of how we see animation if we don't recall that moment. So, you know, this is a constant fight for the recognition of animation as a film form. For Bakshi, I think also we have to kind of see that this, yeah, this is a modernist moment. This is a moment of kind of reinvention, a kind of new language. But he really didn't see it fundamentally as an aesthetic thing, although you can, you can argue that it is, and certainly not a commercial process, um, because he had to argue for the, you know, the commercial grounding of his films. It just happened that they were enormously you know, commercially successful in the first instance with things like Fritz the Cat. But ultimately, he was repositioning animation as a vehicle for political statement. And when you think beforehand, really, um, one of the few films that was made that had uh, animation at its heart and, and was politically engaged was as far back as 1954 with Animal Farm, which of course was made by Halison Batchelor in the UK. Um, and it in itself, in terms of being a film made in the mid-50s, was radical for the way in which it interpreted the talking animal animation. This is still, you know, some 20 years on, or, or towards 20 years on, where we're having to reinvent that idea again, that animation can be used for serious purposes and it can accommodate the talking animal, the talking, uh, you know, figure uh, in, in ways that, that, that say something serious rather than something comic or something kind of sentimental in the Disney tradition. Essentially, for, for Bakshi, the characters, of course, are ciphers for kind of urban experience and social identity. Um, they're not a simple vehicle for gags and choreography alone. Um, that said, of course, there's a particular kind of way in which uh, the characters carry with them a comic persona, uh, a certain kind of radical perspective that is funny in its moment because it's addressing particular kind of conservative moors in the country or making a, a you know a political critique of things that you know were very conducive uh, to the, you know to the mid 70s. Um, but this is kind of also rooting uh, this, this comedy, this, this, this representation in the urban experience. It's saying, you know, what is it like to live in the city? You know, what is it like not to live in Disney's pastoral idylls or Warner Brothers' anarchic cultures? You know, what's it like actually to live in urban cultures, you know, in, in, in America? And also urban cultures kind of under the threat of economic deprivation. So, you know, it's very, very kind of rooted in, in, those, in those ideas. And of course, it's in almost inevitably radical by virtue of doing that with the animated form. 
key for him, of course, was the whole idea of New York. And if New York, New York, you know, had been kind of an on-the-town version of New York, you know, that kind of, you know, the whole kind of musical sensation of what New York represented um, as a kind of celebratory place, you know, suddenly he was saying, well, actually, it's not like that, you know. There's these terrible things that go on in New York, and that's what I'm interested in. It's, it's not New York, New York. It's not a big kind of celebration. It's about kind of getting closer to what's actually there. So all of this, you know, informs his kind of particular view of the world. A good few years ago now, I made a, a documentary uh, with Channel 4 called Cartoons Kick-Ass, which, which was basically about trying to kind of uh, look at the idea of, of, of um, subversive animation and how um, animation functioned as a more subversive art than we had previously imagined. Um, it, it's an easy thing to look at animation as the history of the American animated cartoon. It is much more than that. There are traditions of animation all over the world. But equally, even when you look in the American tradition, there are many more radical facets to it than the kind of Disney version of the world would let us, you know, uh, explore, really. Um, in this documentary, for example, we showed some very early animation of a stag film made for Winsor McKay uh, called Ever Ready Hard On, which was basically, you know, kind of a, a, a marauding penis, effectively, kind of like, you know, in all sorts of sexual acts of one sort or another. And, uh, and kind of, you know, this was, a, you know, made, you know, for, for, for the attention of a stag film for, for, for Winsor McKay's enjoyment uh, and so forth. But what it draws our attention to, and which is what we forget, is that animated films are made by by adults. Even if they're made for children, they are made by adults and virtually all animation of one sort or another has layers of interpretation which are adult in nature. Sometimes very explicitly, sometimes not so much. But as soon as you actually ask students, for example, in my courses, to look at films in a particular way to see the adult content, it's amazing how offended students suddenly get. You know? So this is quite interesting in the sense that Bakshi hated all that. He hated the idea that you, know, you had to put, you know, put that stuff behind closed doors, that you had to slip it in on the back door, that if it wasn't noticeable, it wasn't any good. Why would you do that? Make what you want to say explicit. If it's subversive, it is. Whatever it turns out to be is important. So in that documentary, uh, you know, I just want to show you a sequence from it, which includes uh, an interview that we did with Bakshi at the time. Let's bring that and click on there. There's something happening here But what it is ain't exactly clear The social and political unrest of 1960s and 70s America opened the door to a whole new breed of animation America was growing up, maybe the world was growing up Vietnam was starting, the peace marches were marching You weren't going to get away with the same old maybes you know, or cutie kind of things. I think you had to be very direct or honest, like, you know, something's blowing in the wind. You had a countercultural movement at the time, uh, a part of which was aware of and devoted to the production of politicized and intentionally socially provocative cartoons. That was the beginning of a new trend uh, to uh, connect with people older than children in animation. And of course, Ralph Bakshi was a big pioneer in that with Fritz the Cat, which uh, was based on an underground comic by Art Crumb. It was rated X in this country. It had sex, it had language, it had violence that you hadn't seen in cartoons. I tasted life to the fullest and still my soul cries out, yes, cries out in its hungry, tortured, rat quest. Look at the good side of life. These aren't all bad. Gee, he's handsome. You, you can help me. You must save me. But by so doing, you too will be saved. Well, I, I'd like to, but what can I do? Look at the eyes there. It was coarse. The tracks were coarse. The voice tracks were recorded on the street by non-actors. If I wanted a hippie, I got a hippie. If I wanted a black guy, I got a black guy, you know. Whatever was happening in the streets was in the film. And that compared to Bambi, or compared to Snow White, or Donald Duck, was amazing. And people went crazy. And the kids were tearing the theaters apart. Open up in it! Oh, hippie bastard! 
Do it again. Well, the pigs had opened the door, you hippie bastards. And I thought the roof would come in in the theater. <coughs> so it was that contrast to Disney. It was that that's me up there. That's every kid could relate to what was happening. That wasn't just a an animal anymore. It wasn't a generic animal. It was them in the street. So that was their hippie girlfriends. That was their bathtub. They all had LSD. In there. <laughs> oh, baby, do I feel high? I'm flying. In short, Chris the Cat was like every other white middle class American at that time who was swinging around with the revolution. In other words, they were joining the revolutions to get laid. They were joining the revolutions to have a lot of people listen to them scream, but when things got hot, they left. Wow, the fuck's that thing? Ooh, ooh. Suddenly it's all very clear. I must tell the people about the revolution. Huh? Revolve! Revolve! Damn you, what the hell you jabber about now? I think Ralph was definitely subversive. He was certainly intentionally making different films than what Hollywood and any any animator was making at the time. Look, I done heard enough, man, and I think I'll say so. Ralph Bakshi's explosive film Coonskin went even further. Scenes like this depicting black-on-black -black violence and extreme stereotypes were attacked by black and white groups, and the film was withdrawn. Coonskin was the first time I had ever seen anyone with access to Hollywood's resources talk about racial hypocrisy in America in as clear and as unhypocritical a way as this film did. A couple of you blacks is, you're too dumb to know when you're in big trouble. I don't want you talking to him, Savior. Kill him. The picture was ultimately and endlessly about the, how we explored our black people and how we lied to them. That was ultimately what the picture is about. And that was very offensive to a lot of white groups who exploited black people. It was offensive to the people who sold drugs to the blacks in Harlem. It was offensive to our government. I wanted Coonskin to be the truth about how white people felt about it and how black people felt about each other. Well, you know, the funny thing is that we've always talked about having black people. Yes, it's club. finally, it's very nice to have But I mean, now that you're really here and everything, it's just club. incredible, isn't it? I mean, tell her. Yes, it's incredible. There's a key scene in Coonskin where... America, the country, is anthropomorphized as a tall, blonde, extremely zaftig woman dressed in red, white, and blue, stars and stripes, sitting on a bench and beckoning to a short little black guy. Come on, fella. really only one way to interpret that scene, <laughs> which is exactly the way I think Bakshi meant it, which is it symbolizes the fundamental and consistent betrayal that America has perpetrated against her black population in this country. Oh, she got to clap. <laughs> Since the 1960s, animation has slowly re-established itself as a form of entertainment for grown-ups. But it Okay. So you can see, you know, from this, from, you know, this, this kind of perspective that, you know, the, 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 the Bakshi was very deliberately uh, engaged in this, in this kind of imagery. It was not a kind of an accident at the moment. It was highly specific and he knew exactly who he was offending and why he was offending them. Um, so in a certain sense, you know, his, his subversiveness in a funny way is mapped against his place in animation history as opposed to his culturally. In many senses, he was part of the cultural moment, but it's animation that actually kind of benefits from, from his intervention. Obviously, he was resisting the Disney feature kind of aesthetic and ideology and children's audience. Uh, it's always assumed that animation is, is, is for children. He profoundly resisted that idea. And in doing that, it sounds like a kind of a, you know, well, that's an obvious thing to do, isn't it, type idea. But in its moment, uh, certainly, it, you know, it, it had a radical perspective. He reinvented, of course, the talking animal film. Suddenly, this was not about, you know, kind of cute Disney uh, characters. It wasn't about wise-ass, you know, sort of um, Warner Brothers characters either. Uh, it was about animals that were carrying with them all the kind of metaphor of what it was to live in contemporary America. 
Radicalised animation, of course, with overt and explicit adult content. You know, sex, violence, drinks, drugs, alternative cultures, whatever, you know, we, we, we choose to, to, to alight upon there. Uh, you know, animation really had not done that. That was not to say that animation in other cultures had not actually privileged some of these things and dealt with them in short independent films and indeed in longer films, particularly in Japan. Um, but in, within the American context, this actually radicalised animation very powerfully. And of course, one of the biggest things about, about Bakshi was that, in fact, he was referring back to an older tradition. He was referring back to the Fleischer Brothers and the Betty Boo films, the Popeye films. He was referring to their whole Harlem culture and the whole way in which they embraced, obviously, Cab Calloway, Louis Armstrong and those kind of people in their films, but also very profoundly had sexual content in those cartoons. Uh, they were not innocent cartoons. Betty Boop was very much, you know, a, a, a you know, child whore. It was actually played out as a sexualised character. Character. Tex Avery, you know, expanded the parameters and boundaries of the cartoon, uh, you know, really kind of changing its pace and its dynamic and its issues about status and noise and actually play, you know, plays with that. And perhaps most of all, borrowed the kind of elasticity of people like Bob Clampett's cartoons, which actually, when you look back on them, are the most surreal, uh, actually, and ones that... I think uh, actually borrows much more later on, particularly in a film like Cool World. So he knew his cartoon tradition, is what I'm saying. He knew his cartoon history. He borrowed from it in ways that were pertinent and useful to what he was trying to achieve. But that also links in, of course, to this bigger picture of the independent feature in, in, in the 1970s. Um, it met with the moment of the rise of the movie brats, um, that generation of filmmakers that were the first to go to film schools and in being the first to go to film schools were very self-reflexive about the fact that the films they made referred to other films from the Hollywood tradition or referred to other kinds of tradition. And so of course you've got something like Mean Streets made in the same year as, as, as Heavy Tra Traffic by Martin Scorsese. Scorsese of course, you know, bringing that reinvention of New York to that independent uh, uh, idea but also his kind of way in which he was referring to all sorts of other kinds of movies uh, at the same time. At the same time, too, we had Last Tango in Paris, uh, the whole kind of, you know, sort of... Um overt and explicit way in which was, you know, sex was being used as a kind of political intervention, as something that actually was you know, deeply challenging in terms of the relationship that Bertolucci uh, you know, de depicted. So in, in a certain sense, place heavy traffic against these kind of movies within the independent sector. And Bakshi is actually doing pretty similar kinds of things. He's not as radical within the independent sector, but he is radical within the kind of animation sector. It was interesting that uh, Bakshi, for example, in Hey Good Looking, made some years later, was kind of, make, re, kind of remaking Mean Streets, which was kind of really funny, really, given that Heavy Traffic had already done the job of, 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 of being a parallel film you know, to that. All of these films, of course, are reflexive, they're autobiographical, they are directly reflecting the experience of the people that make them. And uh, they are movie-infused movie in their outlook, they borrow ideas about New York from previous movies, and in Bakshi's case, as I've stressed, from other kinds of, of, of animation. One of the biggest things about it, in things like, uh, you know, uh, Coonskin particularly, was that he was also re resisting a whole strain, strain of B-movie exploitation in terms of black exploitation films, and he much more echoed, say, the Richard Pryor monologues of that of that time, rather than he did uh, the kind of very exploitative dynamics of, of, of representing black people uh, in in the black exploitation movies. And I think this is one of the kind of tensions that, for example, he's always had uh, with somebody like Tarantino. Um, whilst Tarantino really admires Bakshi, Bakshi has reservations about Tarantino because Tarantino celebrates black exploitation in a way that Bakshi honestly believed that. He his films, Coonskin and, 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 and his other films of a heavy traffic, resisted that idea of taking out of the exotica of the black person. You know, it was rather much more invested in the idea of a certain kind of street sexuality that he was aware of and witnessed. So lots of kinds of, you know, factors there that, 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 that this independent sector in the 70s uh, contextualises Bakshi perhaps a little more specifically. And of course, really, the point that I've been making under, uh, under all that is the idea that this, there's, a, there's a recognition for him, a need for recognition in him, as 
his films being films and not merely animation. And this is one of the reasons why, in fact, that there's a number of kind of stylistic interventions in the film as well. There's use of montage and collage and mixed styles in the composition of the imagery that you're, that you're going to see, obviously, if you've not seen the film before. So essentially, he's trying to use the tools of the medium uh, even more than just the specificity of caricature in animation. Okay. Let's just see the trailer then for the film you're going to watch tonight. Ready or not, here it comes. The makers of Fritz the Cat now bring you Heavy Traffic. It's the story of Michael, a 24-year-old pinball-playing virgin. Mick Jagger, I'm not. Angie, his Italian father. Ida, his Jewish mother. I died the day I married a guy. Okay, Ida, come on. This is it. And Carol. Black sweetheart. Now listen here, boy. As long as Carol got this here good thing and this here that, <laughs> she don't need anything else. You'll meet Mom, Rosa, Snowflake, Shorty, Crazy Mo, and the Godfather. You'll meet Hoods, Hustlers, Freaks, Creeps, Cops, Crazy, Weirdos, Winos, Hardhats, Lowlights, and God. This is the voice of God. What's up? It's animated, but it's not a cartoon. It's funny, but it's not a cartoon. It's real. It's unreal. It's heavy. Heavy traffic. So that's that's the trailer. Let's just explore just a few of the kind of things that the themes that are sort of going on in the film. Michael, uh, you know, the, the main character in it is basically a kind of New York ingenue, really, a 22-year-old virgin and cartoonist. And the kind of pinball kind of obviously operates as a bit of a metaphor in terms of the kind of buffeting of his life, uh, you know, in, 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 in New York. Um, it's basically a very, very clear picture of kind of a melting pot kind of immigrant experience and there's a whole kind of dynamic about kind of the Jewish, Italian and black, black cultures kind of, you know, uh, uh, being alongside each other, collaborating, in conflict, uh, you know, aware of each other and aware of their kind of place within, within their culture. There's, a, there's also a nice kind of Godfather parody, uh, as you might have, you know, slightly picked up from the, from the trailer, also in the, in, in the film. And as I say, I want to kind of stress that thing about the kind of, the, the kind of movie brat thing that it's often the case that people are going to look at animation and don't see that it is also referential, the same kind of referential thing that goes on in Scorsese's films or Spielberg's films or any of that generation. Um, you know, the, he was actually doing similar kinds of things. Um, it, of course, looks at the tension between urban problems, but actually ephemeral pleasures. The whole idea of, the, uh, uh, of kind of sex and drugs and rock and roll, as it were, being the things that people sort of have to do or want to do because it's the only escape from kind of embedded kind of urban problems. It's got a live action context, but it kind of matches out that with cartoon freedoms as well. I think Bakshi was really interested in that, about how kind of almost documentary footage kind of like fits to kind of locate us in a, in a real New York, in a real world. But he wanted the cartoon freedoms to actually kind of play with the gags, play with the idea of representing the world in a different way. And so you've got different kind of registers of reality. There's this kind of concrete reality of the live action, but the kind of caricatured reality that uh, Bakshi's trying to show us through the, through the these, through these characters. And one, of course, inevitably kind of matches the other. But here, for example, look out for the whole sequence about the kind of bra sequence in this. Uh, very much a whole set of Tex Avery gags going on in there. He really knows his animation history, certainly borrows a lot from Tex Avery in that sequence. Um, I think what's really interesting for me, actually, is, is that even though this might be pitched at a certain kind of dystopia, you know, this is a really kind of, you know, dark and difficult world, 
underneath Bakshi, and we sort of had this when we were talking to him, he kind of didn't really like the idea that we were kind of thinking about it in this way, but actually that there was a kind of nostalgic romanticism in it as well, that somehow if you did indeed find true love, or that you found some kind of way in which you found comfort and pleasure in life, that it could indeed deal with this dystopia. It's really quite nostalgic in that way. Look out for the Ida's photo sequence, for example, where she's looking back, looking at particular kind of photos from the past, and also uh, there's a reference to, to Hopper's Nighthawks in the, in, the, uh, in the film. So there's always this kind of nostalgic romanticism going on, sort of underpinning the idea of that could be the relief from this, you know, from this nightmare, as it were. And, of course, at the end of the day, the role of art and animation itself. Bakshi has an, an incredible belief uh, in that in relation to what, you know, what it can achieve. And, of course, again, referential kind of material in terms of the Maybelline sequence, for example. Look out for his kind of tribute to George uh, Herriman there, who, who obviously was the author of Crazy Cat. I think the line, it's animated but it's not a cartoon, is actually a really quite nice one in the sense that he's trying to suggest that animation as a form is different from what we understand to be the cartoon, the traditional cartoon in the Disney style. So before we all nod off, here's the kind of legacy bit. This is what, this is what, this is what Bakshi may or may, may not have, have achieved. Simply, I think it's very important in the sense that he did radicalise animated features as films with an ideological, political and authorial purpose through satire. But largely we must think of that always in the American context. You know, in all sorts of other countries, all sorts of traditions were happening where, you know, very kind of adult, mature ideas were going on in the films, uh, but in a different way. But in the American context, the biggest cartoon tradition, he brought that radicalising purpose to it. Later on, of course, he also pushed the boundaries of television series. Terry Toons and Spider-Man and Mighty Mouse all have his kind of imprature in, in, in a certain sense in a certain way. He wanted to kind of make these cartoons kind of more liberal. You know, he resisted the Disney model of professionalism and the kind of use of technology. He wanted it all to be looser, all, all more kind of, in a certain sense, realistic. When he says about Frisk the Cat that it was coarse and that he had people from the street doing stuff and so forth, all of that was in a spirit of rejecting the kind of Disney-esque professionalism that he also perceived in the industry. Later on, you could argue also he reinvented the animated feature fantasy with things like Wizards and Lord of the Rings and American Pop. But crucial in that was actually identifying that there was a young adult audience to be addressed. Previously, there's children, hey, there's adults. But where is that space in between? And I think he felt that he found in most of his films that he was addressing the young adult who was kind of emerging into the world and actually addressing it in a different way. He also thought about script development, very interesting in the whole development of his films, as kind of jazz and poetry and visual association. He was not a traditional script developer. He was a kind of image improviser. And basically, I think this is really quite interesting uh, kind of observation of what he felt he was doing when he says, I was drawing what most people would like to do when they're out of their heads with rage. So it's that sense of being non-censored in what he, was, what he was trying to achieve. And I think allied to that is a very important thing, that in many senses the issue of offence is quite an interesting one. You know, he always adopted the line that if you were going to be offended, then you would be offended. That was just the way it was going to be. Okay, he sustained a voice to talk about animation as a mature adult form, and that's a key thing that happened. And right at the heart of it, he promoted actually the writer and director of animated film. And those are big achievements. Okay, I hope that wasn't too long. I hope that that's helped to enjoy and enrich the film that you're going to watch. Enjoy Heavy Traffic. Thanks very much for listening.